Funding for this program has been provided in part by the U.S. Forest Service through a Wood Innovations Grant and the Nevada Rangeland Resources Commission. I come to really understand and know Cave Valley and Cave Valley Ranch for what it is. And it's an incredible place. It has incredible diversity of wildlife and big game and sage grouse and elk and deer and, and all those things that I've always loved my entire life. And so in 2010, I permanently left my job with the Department of Wildlife and I've been here ever since. We've done 1,450 acre conservation easement with the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation and just countless, you know, habitat improvement projects. But all at the same time, we are an operating cattle ranch. We produce Black Angus cattle. We try to provide the best product that we can in an open range environment. We take very much pride in that. But at the same time, we're very conscientious about how to manage the land and to get us through drought years, you know, reducing numbers and know when to increase numbers and how to balance all that with the native habitat that's been here for eons and to improve upon that. As anywhere else in Nevada, Cave Valley is no exception. Pinion and Juniper is enroaching on otherwise healthy ecosystems, sagebrush ecosystems. And in a combination with that, this ranch has old fire scars from lightning strikes and different things. It's, it's caused concern for us for the PGA being so heavy adjacent to the ranch and on the ranch. Over the years, PJ woodlands have expanded rapidly. In the middle of the 19th century, 1850, when the Little Ice Age ended, what we're standing in was almost entirely sagebrush. That south slope over there was not, that was trees. But out here, this was sagebrush. And as we got towards the end of the 19th century, the climate changes associated with global increase in global temperature set up conditions that made it very easy for tree seedlings to establish out into the sagebrush. And they did, in densities that equal over the entire 20th century that many trees established. Research across the West and the world has shown a significant increase in the woody biomass. Over the past century as forests and woodlands have expanded and infilled, the pinyon and juniper woodlands of Nevada are no different. This change has come with a significant increase in fire fuel loading. Thinning or removing trees in a mosaic pattern can serve as a fire surrogate, break up fuel loads, improve wildlife habitat, and restore watersheds in a more orderly manner than uncontrolled catastrophic wildfire. The problem is, is the pinion and juniper has created such a heavy fuel load in a lot of these areas that when it does burn, it basically incinerates the ground and any, any viable native seed or plants that were there that could have come back in a normal situation. So what comes back? It's the most dominant thriving plant that's in the neighborhood and it's cheatgrass and it thrives on fire. And so we made the decision to do initially a lop and drop treatment on the ranch that involves over 1,100 acres. Lop and drop uh, or lop and scatter as you'll sometimes hear it uh, referred to is a treatment type where essentially uh, you're coming in and cutting the trees and leaving them right on site. So you're catching the trees early in that successional period uh, and trying to favor the perennial grass and brush component of that ecosystem. In doing so, we've noticed a number of benefits from that. There was one 80 acre section that we did that uh, I had no idea that there was even a spring there until we actually took the trees down and the following year, all of a sudden, we have a spring there in an otherwise dry piece of property. And so that spring has actually benefited elk and deer and just an array of wildlife. As a woodland is establishing or re-establishing in the case of uh, post-fire, it really goes through three phases as it succeeds away from that disturbance or as it establishes. So a phase one woodland is really when you're getting some young trees into an area or re-establishing post-fire. In a phase one woodland, the perennial grasses and the brush component are dominating the site and the resources of that site. As you move into a phase two woodland, both your trees, your brush, and your grass species are more co-dominant in that situation. Uh, and so you'll see a real mix 
like we're standing in here. And then as you get into a phase three woodland, really what you're seeing is the trees have the competitive advantage. They're really starting to dominate the resources of a site, whether that be space, water, or nutrients in the soil. And, and you'll actually start seeing the understory plants, both the perennial grasses and in some cases the brush, start to die out as the trees take hold. This is phase one and it was just a scattering of trees across here, but they were starting to approach that, you know, four to five percent cover. There is some uh, studies where they've seen the sage grouse start to avoid these areas once the trees hit that cover. And the grouses have it ingrained in them to avoid any vertical structure, whether it's a tree or a power line or any building or something like that, because they just have that instinct to avoid those, mostly because of predator issues. So when you're looking at balancing, you know, the funding and how many acres you can do, I'm a big proponent of doing a lot of this phase one stuff because it has not yet transitioned where we're losing a lot of the understory vegetation, but we are starting to impact the birds and wanting to avoid these areas because the trees are getting to a level where they just start to avoid it. So as we talk about the encroachment and the infilling, those are two problems because with the encroachment, you cause a sagebrush community in a wildfire situation to burn more intensely. And the same applies for the infilling. A site that might burn in a more mosaic pattern in a pinion juniper community, because you have a lot of infilling, it doesn't burn in a mosaic pattern anymore. And it's very hot. And it means what we get back is not necessarily good. We totally lose the habitat for a long period of time. And if it converts to cheatgrass, then it may never recover again. Mastication is another method for removing pinion and juniper. So a mastication treatment really is more a shredding or a grinding of the tree. Um, essentially what you're doing there is you're taking the biomass uh, from a standing state, uh, basically chipping that tree oftentimes right in place and then scattering the chips on the ground. This was a mastication treatment where none of the biomass was utilized. The grinding head attached to a track that was come in and ground these trees. The biomass has just been spread out to naturally decay. It forms this layer of chips and dead pieces of vegetation on the ground. Some of it acts as a snow catch and, and kind of helps with some of the regeneration as long as we, you know, the chip layer doesn't get too thick on it. I know that there's people that argue that, you know, we're eliminating an ecosystem through the pinyon juniper woodlands, but after an intense fire through that, what comes after that? Cheatgrass. And it's a vicious cycle once that gets going. It's really, really difficult to try and restore back after cheatgrass has become established. So I think we need to avoid that at all costs. We'll monitor pretty intensively for at least 10 years on a three-year interval. Continue to look for efficiencies where we can do things better. Uh, both on the landscape and within our own internal processes, working with strong partners that have the same objectives that we can help work off of each other to maybe get more done and be more efficient to learn from each of the treatments that we do, but always making forward progress as we're going ahead. Not doing something isn't really an option. We need to keep making progress on these watersheds or, or landscapes and keep learning in, as we go along. And what we're showing in the monitoring in general is that we're seeing successful treatments. There is almost, in many cases, an immediate response from that sagebrush community when we remove those trees. Just of it is, over the last 150 years, most of these woodlands, between the climate changes and the influx of seedlings over the 20th century, fuel loads are completely different. And now our environmental conditions are completely different, resulting in far more frequent conditions, what we're now calling red flag conditions, in which all of this are subject to burning. Partnerships, are second to none when it comes to projects on a landscape scale. There is no way a, a landowner can do projects like this on their own. The partnership itself has always been founded on three core pillars to promote sound proactive management of the PJ Woodlands, to make sure that those management actions and prescriptions are based in sound science and followed up on with uh, monitoring pre and post treatment. Really what we're looking for is a reduction in that fuel load. So if a fire does come through, it has more of a natural response. Often if you're looking for the habitat components, your hope is that when the trees come out and they're no longer dominating that site, that you see a release from your perennial understory that's left. So your perennial grasses and forbs as well as uh, your native plant species. You're really hoping that they pick up those free resources and regenerate themselves.